anybody that wants to learn about Index Universal Life, you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, I do the best to try to like educate people, but if you wanna like vet me and what I'm saying or whatever, Bobby Samuelson has the best reputation in the industry. Companies pay him to come in and basically vet their stuff. Uh, and and wow. his, his, his uh, he runs a blog. It's like 99 bucks a month. In my opinion, if you're in this as a professional, it's the best 99 bucks a month you could ever spend. Like, and I don't say that lightly. And so, um, he, he's just amazing. And so it was actually my conversation with him the last time I had him on the channel that inspired this IUL challenge, right? Because what happened was, you know, if you want to bring that board back up again, yeah, that you're showing. So what happened was in my last conversation with Bobby, you know, we were going through this timeline effectively, uh, how you have it written out. Right. Okay. And so I said to him and I go, Bobby, like if, if, if all this is going on and we have this great bull run, isn't it kind of sad that none of these policies have performed? you know, the way, the way that they're told to. Right. And he's like, Chris, like it's, they it, it just, they, they don't now, is it possible for them to sure. We're going to find a unicorn product that's been designed properly, was bought at the right time, maybe managed perfectly along the last 10 years that outperformed the illustrative rates. But that's only going to happen because of the fact that during the past 10 years, the market environment has bailed out the policy, right? Because the growth has been so good that it's almost countered the negative uh, effects of the internal moving parts of the policy. So that's but but even still so i'm doing this challenge where we're giving a thousand dollars away to an agent that can show us uh the pol the the illustration that was submitted with the policy right the illustration as that was originally submitted and an enforced illustration that outperforms 10 years later and out of surrender period that has outperformed the original illustration right and so to this date, I've got over a hundred thousand views on all the platforms of the of the videos that I've created on this, and not one. I've had plenty of people write to me with lots of opinions on stuff. Uh, we've had other agents create videos uh, that leverage third party software and Excel sheets and and spreadsheets that make it look like they've done it. Um, but either they don't like money uh, and they don't want to send me the illustrations, or they're you know they're just they're just being manipulative in some tactic. And I personally believe that the latter is true um but but the bottom line is you know I, I just hit the point where you know bobby and i were talking and it was like why is this not the case and and so i made the comment to bobby and bobby was like listen chris what's saddest is that they probably most policies most policies probably haven't come to performing within 20 to 30 percent of the illustrated rates meaning they're only really performing at about 70 percent of what they were illustrated at at that point in time right and and during the greatest bull run of this index and whatnot it sh i mean the fact that that's happening in that environment what's it going to look like over the next 10 years now that we're at rates are lower now that I'm, i don't know about you but like look at where we're going in this in this world i don't know what the economy looks like i don't think the next 10 years has any chance <laughs> of looking like the last 10 years. Do you? No, no. no. I mean, just based on the videos I've watched of yeah. you and some other very prominent, I mean, guys like Kiyosaki um, in yeah. the, that, that spent a lot of time in reading and understanding crashes, even a guy like Ray Dalio, who I, I respect quite a yeah. bit in that space, yeah. are like, totally. hey, it, it's, it's going to hurt this time. 2020 was like a little sneak peek of that dip yeah. and that fast recovery. But but the money is gonna run dry. Eventually oh. they're gonna run out of printing money and we're already at hyperinflation, although they're not saying we are. They said 9.1% right. recently, but it's more like 15 to 20 when you factor yeah. in food and gas um, and some other yeah, things. Yeah. So yeah, it, the things we actually spend our money up. on. Yeah, totally. things we actually spend our money on. Well, things are lining up for like oh, yeah. the, the best orchestrated crash we can think of and so mm -hmm. to not be positioned in in an opportunity where you can have access to capital guaranteed yep. readily available yep. Yep. and and putting yourself in positions where you can increase cash flow rather than trying to focus on net worth and yep. and when I speak to a lot of um, IUL agents, they're kind of focused on that net worth, that final number. You know, mm -hmm. IUL can look like $20 million in cash value at age 70 or 60 or 55. And I'm mm -hmm. saying, well, my issue is now, like how, how can I, yes, grow my money safely tax-free, but also have liquidity to that. And it's near impossible mm -hmm. 
to have access to cash value in the first few years if you're designing yeah. it for maximum uh, cash value, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong on this in, in the IUL, but uh, some of the designs that I've seen where you have uh, like a high focus on cash value, there's, mm -hmm. it's not available to you. Um, right. If I'm not mistaken. So it's- That's like, you're 100% oh, right. So I have to wait a few years for that money yep. Um, to be readily available. So that means if I would have just had a whole life putting in the same amount of money and I could have 90, 80, 90% of what I put in available yep. and then have that money go work for me in a cash flow producing vehicle, such as a small business where I can sell products and right. services or even real estate if I'm knowledgeable in that. Um, now I'm earning money on two fronts, you know? Totally. Uh, so yep. <clears throat> continue. I, so IUL challenge. No, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there. That's good. Yeah, so I'm learning a lot from you on that aspect. So IUL challenge, 1K is now, one, originally it was 500. Now it's at a $1,000 yeah. payout. Well, you pitched in 250 for it, right? Like, so yes. I had to up it. Like, and I had to, like, I had to match your increase. So I was like, let's just go to a thousand and make it even, you know? Okay. So, Love it. And so, so, you know, like, so I gotta, I gotta give you credit because out of all the people, there've been two people that have kind of gotten behind because I, I'm not gonna lie, like it, it gets, I, I, like I said at the beginning, I put my heart into this and, and I, and I, I genuinely, a lot of people think that I'm just like out this, like, I don't know. I, I feel like I get, you're on a crusade, property. you know, you're on a, yeah, like, yeah. Well, and people just are like, oh, you know, you're just like biased and trying to sell your stuff and whatever. It's like that nothing could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm out there trying to help people because I believe now, do I have my biases and my opinions? hundred percent. Yes, sure. I do. Like anybody else in this world. So I encourage everybody to vet what I'm saying, like go do your research. That's why I so openly give out Bobby's website because like you will find all of the mathematical factual stuff because guess what? He is basically, he's not an actuary. So I don't want to say he is, but he basically teaches actuaries what to do effectively. Right. And so wow. he knows the math behind these things well, that nobody else in the industry does. Right. And so I, he's, infinitely smarter than me when it comes to this like i'm just a better like maybe marketer around it right like and so like i'm just i leverage his stuff and i i vet what i'm saying go read his stuff go read other like do your research don't just take any one person's opinion you know as anything like i would say um you know so i'm, I'm not trying to just sell this but what i will say is i'm hyper passionate about what we are able to do for people from a financial structure perspective. And I think what we're able to do, people like you, people like me, people like my buddy Caleb, he, you know, at Better Wealth, people, um, you know, like a lot of the banking people, even though I, you know, I don't agree with 100% of infinite banking per se, 98% of it, I think is right on the money. And, and what I would say is like the people that do this right, like I'm a big believer of everybody needs an emergency fund, everybody needs an opportunity fund, we need safe money before we go out and take a lot of risk, market cycles happen, we got to prepare for the market cycles, we got to make sure we're, we're insulated, we're protected, because there's all these studies that investor behavior is the number one reason that people fail with their investment strategy. And so if that's the case, why don't we implement a strategy that eliminates the investor behavior problem, right? And that's what I'm passionate about is helping people solve the number one problem that's holding all the people back. Even if the market performed well enough, it's the investor behavior that kind of makes it so people fail. So let's, and they, it, it, the investor behavior happens because of poor financial structure, because the market cyclicality, I think that one of the greatest myths told in this world is the younger you are, the more risk you can take. Now, I understand the concept of that because of the fact that you're young, you have time to make up for losses, so it's not gonna kill you, right? Whereas if you're 58 and you lose everything, well, you don't have as much time to make up for it. And so the sentiment is accurate, but the bottom line is if we know that you're 25 and you're gonna work till 65, that's 40 years. We know there's gonna be four to six boom bust cycles during that time. Go look through history. We know it's gonna happen. And so if that's the case, and we know that more people create wealth during the bust cycles than during the boom cycles, why are we not preparing systematically for the bust cycles, right? To really take advantage of those. Why are we not trying to prepare? What's that? No, I, I like that. I like that. It's very interesting. The, the it just, it doesn't, yeah. Bust. Well, so, and think about it this way. What happens is people need to save before they invest, but they need to save with the intent of investing. And so during my, like, let's just take a 25 to 35 year old. Let's just say that that, 
You start at 25 at the beginning of a boom cycle, and then at 35, it's a bust, right? You can feel really good. Let's say you jam money into your 401k and IRA and Roth IRA, and you're feeling really good and you have a good job and you maybe get a couple of promotions over the decade, things are good. And then you're 35 years old and the market goes through a complete nosedive like 2008, right? Or like COVID and you lose your job or something of that nature, right? And then, or maybe something like we're coming into right now, right? Yeah. Like, and so let's, it happens. And when that happens, you're, retirement values go down because you re invested before you saved, which is what most people do because 64% of Americans don't have access to $2,000 in a retirement in a, in a savings account, which is insane, right? So what do you do? You leverage your 401k, your Roth and those accounts, your investment accounts as your rainy day fund, which is like one of the worst things you can do. You lose your job. You're worried about how you're going to pay your bills. You're worried about making your mortgage payment and you're putting food on the table for your wife and the kids because you probably got married and had kids in that 10 year window. You know, you have all these responsibilities that you didn't know you had or that you were going to have. And, and so now what happens is because you lost your job, now you need to liquidate a negatively performing asset just to survive. And now at 35, before you know it, you got nothing and you're starting over. You lost a decade of possibility. Mm. Like that is the cycle that is killing Americans right now. That is it. And wow, that is my passion. Why I do what I do to teach people. Now, people that sell IULs are hurting potentially our ability to be able to serve people to solve that problem. Because what's going to happen is regulators are eventually going to lump IUL and whole life together, even though nothing could be further from the, like they are totally two different opposite products. Mm. Regulators put, were at risk of having them lumped together. So is there a reason that I'm so aggressive against it? Yeah, it's to protect the baby that I love. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's that's the reason. I'm, I'm trying to protect the thing that I know can help people, right? Whereas this other thing is like a cancer, in my opinion, you know, like that, that's, you know, think about it this way. Think about it this way. If when, when you get an IUL, you basically are a profit center of the company because most IULs, when you think about it, all the moving parts, whether it's with a participating mutually held company that created an IUL, like a mutual, for instance, or yeah. whether it's, um, whether it's, uh, with a, with a stock company, like a Symmetra, let's call it, or, you know, something of that nature, right? Like doesn't matter what end of that pendulum mutual company or not, it's still an IUL. So you still are a profit center for the company. You don't participate in the profits through a dividend with the company like you do in a, in a whole life. In fact, mm. I'm just going to kind of throw a pen under the bus right now really quick. Like if I were to buy an IUL, the last company I would want to buy it with is a mutual company because the mutual companies have a lot of whole life on the books with a lot of guarantees. And as a policyholder with a participating mutually held company, you they have uh, the, the company has an obligation to support those dividends and guarantees, right? So if they get taxed or stressed in the performance of their general fund, all they have to do is move the moving parts in the IUL to create more profit because you're a profit center to support the whole life company, the whole life policy holders. That's it. And so, and, and when, when push comes to shove, if you're with a Symmetra, if you're with a, a publicly traded stock company or any kind, even if it's not publicly traded, if any kind of stock company that's selling IUL, their obligation is not to you, the policyholder, it's to the shareholders of sure. the company. So if they start struggling to, to meet profits, what mm -hmm. do you think they're going to do? They're going to come raid you. The IULs are one of the most profitable products on the books of, a, of, of the insurance company. So they're going to have you as a profit center. So if I had to choose between, I want to be a profit center of a company, or I want to be effectively a shareholder of a company that participates in the success of that company, which are you going to choose? Like holder all day, yeah, all day long. Like, so yeah. like the thing about this is like, when we just back out of this and stop looking at the illustrations and you know, all the nuances, although I love getting into details to show people while they're all kind of smoke and mirrors. Like if we just use common sense, you start to realize like, whoa, <laughs> like, this is not what I thought it was. You know, I, I want this, you know, I want the whole life policy. When you really break it down to people in a very simplistic, like, who do you want as a business partner? Like what's, what, if you were to get into business or to buy a contract, which contract do you want? Right. And the reason I love whole life insurance right now, because of the world that we're in whole life insurance companies have been around for 180 years, you know, since the 1840s. And if we know that, 
And we know that whole life companies have managed transitions. Sorry if I'm going off topic, by the way, but yeah. we know that they've managed transitions through three different versions of the dollar. Think about that. Like three different versions of the dollar from the institution of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, in the 1870s, and then in the 1840s, there were three different dollar changes. Yet the insurance companies that we work with never missed a dividend. They managed those transitions beautifully. And so with everybody right now talking about like where Am I going to keep my money, right? And what's going to happen in this world? Are we going to lose the status of the world's reserve currency? Is the dollar going to lose its value? Is it this? Is it that? What do life insurance companies do? Participate in mutually held life insurance companies do one thing and one thing alone. They mitigate risk and they preserve the purchasing power of your money. And if it comes to crypto, for instance, do I like crypto? Yeah, I speculate in crypto. I, it, it's, it's on my, you know, I don't think it's for everybody. If crypto becomes a real viable thing, guess what? Life insurance companies are going to get involved in it. They just will. You know, they like and, and they'll start utilizing it as a hedge to make sure that they get where they want to get and, and that, that your money is protected. I'd rather rather than me try to pick and choose the time on the dollar and the devaluation and the world's reserve currency getting lost. I'd rather my money be in a life insurance company that has a general fund with billions of dollars being run by the best money managers in the world to mitigate that risk and have my money in a place where a lot of Congress people Ben Bernanke and all these people have their money because I know that they're not going to just like allow those elite people to have their money go up in smoke. Right. right? I, so like to me, I want to do what the most successful people in the world are doing and this is what they're doing, you know? And so, you know, when, when all these clickbaity titles, like do what the rich people do or do what the wealthy do, like I kind of get irritated at a lot of like the clickbaity kind of stuff, but at the same time, there's truth behind it. I just wish people would go into more depth about why that truth exists. Yeah.